Hi, wonderful students. Here's the Unit 5 review video for the Unit 5 test on World War I and World War II. In the barn, in the World War I and II folder, there is a study guide which you may want to download. And you also have gotten that in class. And this video goes along with that. And this encompasses the multiple choice questions for the video. Remember, the DBQ is based on documents we've seen and should include additional information that you know about these topics. All right, so let's start off with World War I. Basically, it starts when this Serbian guy, member of the Black Hand, Gavrilo Princep, assassinates Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, Sophie. As a result, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. This had support of Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany. They said, hey, Austria-Hungary, if you declare war, we got your back. We're ready for this. Now, the alliance system now draws all these countries into the war. Russia said, hey, we'll protect you, Serbia. Britain says, hey, we're going to protect you, Belgium, and things like that. Of course, we discussed the other causes of the war. If you think mania, militarism, nationalism, imperialism, things like that. And the war actually starts with the Schlieffen Plan, which was Germany's plan to avoid a two-front war, where they're going to sweep through Belgium, which was supposed to be neutral, well, right, and into France. And most of the French troops are on the German border. It was supposed to take Russia about six weeks to mobilize, but with railroads and things, it only took Russia two weeks to mobilize French. France was able to move its troops along the German border to the Belgian border, so it was basically an epic fail for Germany. But now that the French and the Allies were against the Germans, um, this is the Western Front, which was basically trench warfare. So you got soldiers, you know, stuck in the muddy trenches, protected with barbed wire, uh, using very deadly machine guns, which meant they really couldn't get up and cross and move very much because they would get mowed down. That was no man's land in between. So that, that those lines didn't move much like they did in the Eastern Front, which were much more mobile, the area between Germany and Russia. Russia left the war early because they were having a revolution, they were less industrialized, they had a famine going on, a civil war, and all that sort of stuff. World War I finally ends, and the big four meet. Think the U.S., the U.K., Italy, and France. And the Treaty of Versailles gives the, the terms of the end of the war, and they say, hey, Germany, you're responsible for the war, as in all of it. And that's the war guilt clause. And Germany over there was like, yo, das ist nicht gut. This is not good. Why are we responsible for all of it? There's other results. The League of Nations, which was Wilson of the United States, great idea, one of his 14 points. Germany had to pay reparations, they had to demobilize, uh, there couldn't be secret alliances and all that sort of stuff. Okay, now we're going to go to the interwar years. The interwar years saw an increase in fascism throughout countries of the world, specifically uh, I think Germany and Italy with Mussolini and Japan and um, even the Soviet Union. Fascism is a totalitarian type of government where the state is deemed higher than the individual. So don't think all that uh, enlightenment stuff where, you know, individuals have rights. It was what could the individual do for the state. In Germany, at the same time, with Nazis in power, they were wanting to regain their power and prestige um, days from before the Treaty of Versailles. Hey, fast forward some more. Hitler has the Munich conference, the München conference, and he's like, yo, people, um, I don't really want all of Czechoslovakia. I just want some German-speaking areas, so let me have it. And, you know, people like uh, Chamberlain of the UK were like, okay, because we don't want to go to another war again. So that was called appeasement. Hitler was also saying, hey, Soviets, let's sign a non-aggression pact. Because if we, say, go into Poland, which is now between us, and say we go to war again, I don't want a two-front war like World War I. But in September of 1939, Hitler invaded Poland, and now Britain and France declare war on Germany. Like, you've crossed the line, Hitler. We are not going to appease you no more. Battle of Britain occurs. German Luftwaffe has a blitzkrieg. Uh, and then they realize that the British um, realize that Germans, Germany's advances could be stopped and that Hitler now was advancing on the Eastern Front focus there. France had, okay, abrupt cut up there. So France was fallen to Germany, and French stayed under German control until the Allies started to change that on D-Day. So I'm going to show you some of that with some of the map from our class. Okay, super technological wall map. Japan was imperializing in Southeast Asia. They needed um, oil and rubber, things like that. 
They were afraid of the U.S. fleet in Pearl Harbor, so they bombed Pearl Harbor 1941, which draws the U.S. into the war. Japan was sort of in the lead there until the turning point was the Battle of Midway. The U.S. continued to get closer to Japan with the idea of island hopping, a conquering one island at a time. The U.S. was successful after Midway in doing this, but it was very costly. The battles of Iwo Jima and Okinawa in particular were extremely costly in terms of human lives. It wasn't finally uh, until the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan that Japan then surrendered and World War II was over. Uh, the war in Europe already was over by April and May of 1945 with Germany's surrender. Um, I, over a year after D-Day happened, so it took that long to push Germany out for them to surrender. And then a few months later, Japan surrenders. And that brings us to the end of World War II. So now that you watched this brief summary of World War I and II, I'm sure you're wondering what else should you do. Well, make sure you've gone through the study guide if you haven't already. Go through the PowerPoints for this unit. Go through the videos I've posted on this unit, which are all in the barn. Look at your classwork and your homework. So hopefully you did a good job with that. Look at the old quizzes I've passed back. Some of those questions will be the same. Use your textbook and look at the review at the end of the chapters of World War I and II. Make sure you can answer the questions. Then you should study more and then study some more. If you have any questions, of course, email me. Don't wait till the night before the test because I might not be able to get back to you in time. And uh, see you next class. Good luck, everybody.